Hey, good morning, everybody. It is Babette Haggerty with Haggerty Dog Training. It's Friday morning. I'm very late doing our Thursday Q&A. I apologize. Um, as you know, and as I've mentioned before, um, dog trainers are slammed, and we just need to rework our social media schedule, our posting calendar, <clears throat> because Thursdays, we're just so busy. We just, I just can't squeeze in the time to do a Q&A on Thursdays. So I'm definitely going to... Uh, revamp my schedule and we'll keep you posted on that. But we had a lot of good questions that came up this week. And again, I know I haven't been on the last couple of weeks. It's been a hit or miss and I do apologize for that. So I appreciate your patience. People have been asking where we are and we're just busy training dogs. That's what we're doing. And I had a dear friend that um, came in the other day to visit Steve Diller, who's an awesome dog trainer. And, you know, he said something to me about the fact that like a lot of his information, you know, people can argue that it's anecdotal. But it's funny because we were reading some scientific studies the other day, or he referenced some, and I went back to look them up. And I was like, gosh, they did a scientific study a few years ago. But dog trainers knew about this stuff anecdotally 15, 20 years ago. It's kind of crazy how that stuff works. Anyway, so one question that came up, I'm just referencing my notes, is um, can you train a, a dog on a harness? Yeah, you can train a dog on a harness. It just takes you a whole lot longer than a leash and collar <clears throat> or any other tools. Now, think about harnesses. Who uses harnesses? People who want to train uh, police dogs for tack work because when you restrain a dog, and that's what a harness does, a harness restrains the dog and holds the dog back. It antagonizes them. It builds up that drive. It builds up that adrenaline. It builds up that rush, that go, 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 go. Same thing with like draft horses. They are pulling and pulling and it's that oppositional reflex that kicks in. So their instinct is when you have the harness on them is to pull. Same thing with sled dogs. Why do we put harnesses on sled dogs? So they can pull more comfortably. That's what it does. They get into the oppositional reflex. Now guide dogs are taught, taught <clears throat> to pull into the harness. They pull the harness because they're weaving a way for the person to get through a crowd. They're weaving their way through things, okay? And the way they're weaving their way through things is they're pulling their handler along. However, one important note is guide dogs will have a harness, yet a leash and collar, so that the handler can actually correct and control them better because they can't control them as well with a harness. <clears throat> So yes, do harness, can you train a dog on a harness? Absolutely, you train the guide dog to pull into the harness. However, it does take longer when you're teaching obedience skills, and that's my dog training me to pet her, stop, by nudging my arm and knocking the laptop out of my hands. Um, so yes, it trains the dog to pull. You can train them. It just takes a lot longer, and it's a lot more difficult. You have less control over them because, again, they give into that oppositional reflex, and they're going to pull, pull, pull. Um, search dogs are the same way. When we're searching for somebody or something, uh, you know, police dogs are using tracking dogs to find somebody. We don't want to guide the dog on which way to go. We really don't want necessarily the dog to look to us for direction. We want them to take the scent and go and show us where that person or thing is. So yes, we put a harness on them and we let them go, 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 go. It teaches a dog to pull and it allows them to pull more comfortably. That is the reality behind harnesses. Now, <clears throat> um, again, someone said, oh, but, you know, training a harness is kinder. I, I don't agree with that. When you use a leash and collar properly, the dog is not pulling on the collar tightly. Okay, you're not restraining the dog. You teach the dog to pay attention to you and walk on a nice, loose leash. That is the goal. Yeah. Now, if you want a dog that pulls, and I'm, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the work of a dog and service work. You know, if you want a dog that's going to pull, then by all means, throw the harness on them. If you want the dog to control the situation, knock your socks off. However, it is one of the most least efficient ways to train a dog for basic obedience skills. Um, of course, again, if you want a sled dog, go for it. If you want to train your dog to be a guide dog, yes, they need to learn to pull into that harness. And they do so much more comfortably on the harness. Um, or when you put the harness on them, you want them to learn to lean forward and pull together. Um, a great analogy is 
pulling, 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 holding that dog back. Great analogy is the barroom brawl analogy. Think about a barroom fight. You've got two guys who are drunk and being stupid, and their friends are pulling them back. And they're saying, no, come on, don't do it, don't do it. And their friends are getting bigger and bigger. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill you. They're getting bigger and bolder and bolder and bolder and bolder and bigger and bigger and bigger. If their friends quit holding them back and restraining them and gave them a good shove and just said, go ahead, kill each other. We don't care. Those two guys that are fighting would become a lot smaller and a lot quieter very, very quickly. So that's my, my spiel on harnesses for today. Uh, the next thing I want to talk to you about is dogs and their purpose. We could spend hours and hours on this. Um, we've had a few people that have come in recently. They want to train their dogs to be service dogs. Or they're concerned that their specific breed of dog is not being fulfilled because they're not doing the work that they were bred to do. Look at dogs in New York City. New York City, you have dogs, German Shepherds, Doodles, Newfoundlands. Yes, people have them, Italian Greyhounds, Terriers. You have all sorts of dogs in New York City, Pit Bulls, etc. Now, those German Shepherds are not going to Central Park herding sheep every day. I can assure you of that. Uh, those Newfoundlands are not swimming in the Hudson River saving lives every single day. I can assure you of that. They are not necessarily doing the work that they were bred to do. But they are being mentally stimulated, physically stimulated, and exercised and challenged. How so? Okay, we have to go for a walk. We go on a morning walk. Over, sit, stay. Lay down, stay. You put them, you tell them to stay. You put the leash and collar on them. You open up the door. You walk to the elevator nicely. You're not being dragged to the elevator. You tell them to sit and stay at the elevator. You walk into the elevator. They have to sit and stay while people are coming in. They're working. They're working. Their mind is working. You're telling them what to do. They're being challenged. They're being challenged mentally and physically. They get out in the street. They're not dragging their owner down the street as they're carrying their bags. They're walking politely on a leash. They're being designated which tree to attend to do their business. They're being told, okay, let's go to the next tree, etc. They're constantly being worked and constantly being stimulated. Are they going out there and herding, herding sheep and saving lives? No, but if you work with your dog on a daily basis and you don't have to work with them every single um, constantly, but if you spend a few minutes a day just teaching them new skills or reinforcing the skills they have, whether it's rollover, play dead, etc., that mental stimulation for 15 minutes is going to do a heck of a lot more for your dog than jogging them two or three miles a day. I had a family this week that they said, you know, we were thinking about getting rid of him. We really wanted him to be a service dog for us, um, for one of us. And we found a family and they have a large yard. So think about that dog in the suburbs. They have a large yard. So the owners are going to get up. They're going to open up the door and say, okay, Rover, go outside, run and play. Rover might run a couple of laps, go do his business and then lay down there. What, what next? There's no mental stimulation there. There's no one communicating with him, giving him any kind of a direction, challenging him in any way, teaching skills. He has, he's isolated in the backyard. So having lots of room to run and play, the dogs are not going to do that. They are going to do much better when you're constantly working with them. If they need a lot of work, of course, um, they're going to do better when you constantly work with them and you're giving them commands, you're giving them things to do, you're giving them the opportunity to practice their skills. Again, and that could be paw, roll over, play dead, sit, stay, come, down, go get me the newspaper. But just throwing a dog out in the backyard expecting him to entertain himself is not, you know, the most fair way or better life for a dog, better than living in an urban environment like New York City. Now, some dogs, yes, urban dogs definitely need a lot more training very often because there are a lot more triggers around. And depending on the breed that you have, you absolutely positively will need to work with them. You know, if you have a, a dog that, you know, I'm, I'm going to pick on pit bulls. If you have a pit bull that comes from, you know, a fighting background and you saved that dog and good for you, congratulations. I think that's awesome that you saved the dog. You know, you might have a challenge initially walking that dog down New York City streets where every 15 feet they see a dog. You're going to have to work with that dog. 
Now, are you going to produce anxiety in that dog? No, because you're going to give the dog a different job to do. The dog is going to not act out by being triggered by other dogs. He's going to be given other skills and responsibilities to do. He's going to be mentally challenged in different ways, not the mental challenge he was bred to do or, or that he was being used for in his previous life. So suppressing a dog's natural abilities can be difficult. Um, and it, it's, I mean, there's so much more I can explain than, than the time we have for this short video. But are you suppressing the dog's abilities? No, you're really in essence redirecting that dog into different work. For example, if you called me up and said, I want a service dog, I would say, okay, you want a Labrador Retriever because that is the most the best all-around dog for whatever the service work is that you need. And you want to call somebody like Debbie Kay, who breeds for that specific purpose. Okay. If you want a dog for anxiety, you want a dog for PTSD, you want a dog um, for different reasons because you're a very nervous person, you don't want to get a dog that has high energy. You want a dog that is calmer. Okay. High energy dogs are like your shepherds, okay? Um, <clears throat> you know, if you have a if you have a, a nervousness and you wake up with night terrors and you have a lot of anxiety and you can't quite calm down, not only am I going to recommend yoga and pranayama breathing exercises for you, but I'm not going to recommend that you get a Malinois. I don't care how smart they are. I don't care how good looking they are. I don't care how many of your friends have them. You don't need a Malinois. You need something a little bit calmer that is going to help calm you and your nerves down. So it's super important that you get the right dog. If you want a dog to just be a companion and you don't worry about, you don't want to worry about not giving them the ability to do the work that they were bred to do, then go get a pug. They're the cutest dogs. They will just lay at your feet all day and make you laugh. They're not, they don't want for anything, throw the ball for them, take them for a walk, and they are good to go. Get a Maltese. They'll lay on your lap all day. Get an Italian Greyhound. They'll sit there and they won't move a muscle. And they'll be very sweet and they'll be very pretty. And you don't have to worry about suppressing their, their desires and, and what they were bred to do, the work that they were bred to do. The reward is in the work. Whatever work you give them, just give them a job to do. It doesn't necessarily have to be herding dogs, saving lives, or, or you know retrieving your, your dead pheasant. Give them a job to do. And that can be very simple with obedience and agility. And if you don't have access to agility equipment, tricks. Use tricks. Tricks are a great way to exercise dogs mentally and physically. All right. Um, fearful and anxiety. Anxiety seems to be the buzzword these days. I've never met so many people who say their dog has anxiety. Excuse me, as I have in the last few years. Dogs... Owners that come to me and tell me their dog has anxiety, dog usually doesn't have <clears throat> as much anxiety as the owner thinks they do. They're lacking self-confidence. Yes, they may be nervous. However, what happens is it's a miraculous thing. You start training a dog and you challenge them mentally. You challenge them physically. You teach them skills to learn. They become more confident. They're happier. They feel good about themselves because they're learning skills and their brain is not wasting away being terrified of everything. They're going out and about. They feel better. You know, think about an anxiety producing time in your life. And, you know, I've tried to come up with a lot of examples over the years. And the best example I, I've come up with, which unfortunately, well, I guess hurricanes do hit the Northeast now. When I was in Florida many years ago training dogs, you know, we used to get these hurricanes. They're a little stressful, okay, especially when you have like a Cat 5 heading straight towards you. You have to, you know, lock up your house and you don't just get to, you know, close your, your blinds and put some tape on the windows because it doesn't work that way and then lock your door and get in the car and go. It doesn't work like that. You have to bring in everything from outside. You have to make sure there are no trees that are hanging, your hoses, everything. You have to put up your shutters. Shutters are very time consuming. It can be very anxiety producing. And I remember back in, I'm going to say, I think it was <clears throat> 02, 03, and 04, we were hit back to back with hurricanes in Palm Beach County, one right after the other, after the other, three years in a row. 
And I remember, you know, I think we had a Cat 5 that was coming for us. And by the grace of God, like at the last minute, it veered north and did not hit us. It went back out to sea, I think. Anyway, those were pretty stressful times. Everybody was stressed. And I remember I would say to people, hey, were you here for, you know, the hurricanes last year? Oh, God, yeah. Um, and were you here for the hurricanes this year? Yeah. You know, the hurricanes at that time were actually worse than the year before. But because we've gotten used to them and the people of Florida had gotten used to the hurricanes, they weren't as stressed anymore. It wasn't that big of a deal. You get used to it. Same thing with dogs. You know, anytime you're going through, and humans, anytime you're going through an unknown experience, you're going through something you've never experienced before. It's a whole lot worse going through it the first time because your fear sets in. And whenever we make fearful decisions or we go through fear, we don't think rationally. And what happens is when we have these fearful experiences, we don't think clearly. When we get pent up, we become a bundle of nerves. But once we start going through these ex experiences and these circumstances, and we've gone through them a few times, we realize it's really not so bad. It really isn't that bad um, because we're now an old pro at it. We've done it before. So, you know, if you think your dog is fearful or anxiety ridden, they might be fearful of the moment. Okay, but get them out there, expose them to everything you possibly can without saying, oh, baby, it's okay. It's okay, baby. And loving on them and loving on them and petting them and stroking them. Let them learn to deal with life on life's terms. They're going to become more confident. Teach them new skills, teach them new commands, teach them tricks. Anytime a dog learns a new skill or a new trick, they feel better about themselves. They're more confident about themselves. Um, so get them out there and work with them as much as possible. Don't be afraid to startle them. They're not going to hate you. They're still going to love you and you're not going to break them. They are going to become way more confident and happier once they realize that the world is not this terrible place. And the only way to ex teach them that the world is not a terrible place is to expose them as much as possible to many different situations. Um, there is an element of stress and training anything new. And this goes back to what I was just talking about. Anything new can be stressful. Okay? Anything new can be scary for people and for dogs or any animal for that matter. But once they do it a couple of times, they realize like, oh, it's not so bad. Now, right now we have quite a handful of dogs coming in. And uh, Emily said to me the other day, why are we getting all these problem dogs lately? And, and the biggest thing, and this is my next beef, is we're getting all these problem dogs from that had gone through training elsewhere. We have one dog in here who's like a nervous little girl. We couldn't get near her. She was snapping at us. She would pee all over the place. She had been to another trainer for a year and a half, just taking group class after group class after group class after group class after group class. But there was really no direction. There was no plan of action for the dog. And the dog was probably in overwhelm. I'm sure there were a lot of things that were going on. But the dog was probably also in major overwhelm. And the owners, because they were in a group class, they weren't getting the clear instructions that they needed to help this dog along. So, <clears throat> you know, why are we getting problem dogs? And my question is, why are there dog trainers out there not fixing these problems and just telling people, put the dog down, send the dog back? And I'm hearing this, put the dog down and, and send the dog back. You know, I've had a whole lot of dogs come in where the trainers have told them, send the dog back. And we work with the dogs and it's like, why would you have sent this dog back? This is a lovely dog. There's nothing wrong with this dog, you know? And maybe it's because some trainers out there want the easy way and they want the easy dogs. And believe me, I get it. The last year and a half has brought out so many dogs and so many owners. We cannot keep up with the volume. Um, it's a gift in some ways because it gives us the ability to pick and choose, but we really want to help all the dogs that we possibly can. However, you also have to understand that trainers are a little tapped right now. Um, we're, we're tired because we've had like some, some, you know, the pandemic brought out some, the crazy in, in a lot of people. So one thing you have to be patient to is, you know, if you can't get in right away, don't give up on your dog. There's no reason to give up on your dog. You don't need to give up on your dog. I can't remember. Well, okay. That's not true. I had a dog that came in about a month ago. And I said to myself, and I said to this owner, and I actually referred her to get a second opinion. And this other trainer, Bob May, and I agreed, this dog needed to be put down. 
Like this is a dog, do not pass go, do not collect $200. This dog needs to be put to sleep. And it was a young dog and it was not wired properly at all. And um, it was going to grow up to do harm to somebody, great harm to somebody one day. That is the first time I've seen a dog that I really felt needed to be put down in quite some time. Um, actually in a couple of years and I know who that other dog was and that other dog was probably the first time I had seen another dog that needed to be put down in quite some time. So, or, or sent back, you know, most of the dogs don't need to be sent back to the breeder. It's great that if you're in a situation and you have a breeder that will take the dog back, but sometimes it's just a matter of doing the right amount of work, not necessarily lots of work, but the right work. And when you do the right work on the dog, miracles happen. And you can really turn the dog around. Um, okay, I talked about the large yard. I talked about the harnesses. I talked about some fear and anxiety. Oh, another question this week. My dog is always eating grass. Is that okay? Well, you know, they've had two studies. And, you know, you can make a study out to be whatever you want that study to look like. <laughs> One study was that um, the dogs eat the grass because they're feeling nauseous and it helps them uh, produce the bile to throw up. And another study said that they eat the grass to stop themselves throwing up. Who knows? If your dog eats grass, it's really not a big deal. However, I will say, if your dog eats grass, find out what your lawn is treated with. If you have a landscaper, you want to make sure that your dog is not ingesting grass that's chemically treated. You want to make sure that if you have a landscaper and you treat your grass, that you're using organic products, if you're using anything at all. Because you don't want your dog ingesting something you know, his form of lettuce from romaine that's basked in, in pesticides of any kind because over the long term, they will get sick and they will probably end up with cancer. Um, all in all, it is okay if they eat the grass. Just find out what that grass, what is on that grass. Um, I talked about the service dogs. I talked about, you know, suppressing the behavior. Again, um, you're not suppressing the behavior, you're working, you're redirecting the behavior into something else. You're redirecting that energy into a much more positive outlet, giving them much more confidence. The reward is in the work. Uh, the other thing I want to address is blocking. I see this all the time. How many times have you been driving down the street and you see somebody walking their dog? They're walking their dog and the dog is distracted by another dog, you know, in the distance or cat or whatever it is and they're blocking their dog, and they're struggling, and they're all over the place trying to block the dog. The dog knows that something's there, and the dog is going to continue to struggle with you, excuse me, struggle with you to get whatever it is that they want. And I had a girl in uh, class, she came to the first group class the other day with the dogs, it's the first week with the dogs, the first, I'm sorry, the first week we don't have dogs, we train the owners, the second week we train the dogs and the owners. It's a tremendously effective technique for uh, dog training. And, and group classes. <clears throat> However, that's besides the point. So I was working with her and she kept blocking the dog. I said, why are you blocking the dog? Oh, the last trainer told me to do that. But she's struggling and the dog is all over the place. I said, look, we don't want you to block the dog and hide the dog from the distraction. We want the dog to learn to lay there, watch the distraction and be positioned between you and the distraction and let him lay there and just watch that distraction go by. Blocking doesn't do anything. It sort of puts a Band-Aid on it, but it's like putting a wet Band-Aid on things because it doesn't even really help. You want the dog to lay down between you and the distraction and lay there and relax. That is your ultimate goal, not blocking. Blocking's not going to get you there. Yes, there are a few steps you have to, to take in order to get the dog to lay down, relax in between you and the distraction, but that is your goal. Blocking is not going to get you there. Having the dog in there, uh, sitting and staying first and telling them stay, stay, stay so that they learn to relax. They're learning to relax. You want your dog to learn to relax. You don't want them to have that adrenaline rush they have when they're all pent up, chasing dogs, lunging at people, barking at, at kids, etc. That that They're amped up, amped up, amped up. If you give that dog a correction, a fair and simple correction, okay, you're going to interrupt that adrenaline rush. You're going to slow them down and they're going to settle, much more so than if you restrain or you block. Now, corrections are a whole other topic, you know, and, and that can be a very heated conversation. And I'm not getting into that today, although I'm more than happy to get into that in the future. But anybody who knows me, who's been trained with me, yeah, I use corrections. I correct a dog. I tell them no. 
Why do I correct a dog and tell them no? Because it is the most efficient way to get the dog where you want them to be so that they don't have to spend a year and a half in group classes with treats dangling in front of them getting absolutely nowhere. Or restraining the dog, blocking the dog for four months and the dog still has the same problem. If you correct that dog firmly and fairly, boom, the problem solved. The dog's like, oh, okay. Now, I have a Norfolk Terrier in front of me right now, and he's staying. He's chilled out. He's relaxing, and he's watching the squirrel. Anyone who knows Norfolk Terriers, they tend to chase squirrels. Now, he does like to, to chase the deer, but I tell him no, and he stops, and they learn to relax, and that's what you have to do with your dog, and that's the purpose of a distraction, a correction. You interrupt that behavior. You tell them no. You teach them. They learn through practice and building more skills to relax and chill out so that they don't get amped up, that adrenaline doesn't rush through them, and they want, they want, they want, they pull, they pull, they lunge, they lunge, they lunge. So don't be afraid to correct your dog, but correct them fairly. And if you feel like you're correcting your dog and they're not stopping, then you're not really correcting them. You think you are, but you're really not. And, and that's okay too. That's why you have trainers to help you guide guide you through that process. Anyway, okay, um, I'm about done here. I think I've gotten through all of my questions. Um, please feel free to put, you know, send us more questions, email us more questions, whatever it is you would like. <clears throat> and until I see you guys next week, we will put up on Monday our new social media schedule so you guys can keep up. In the meantime, I hope you all have a wonderful, wonderful day. And I hope wherever you are, uh, you are enjoying some beautiful fall weather. Thanks again for tuning in and have a great day.